12. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself, why did Jesus pick 12 disciples? I got a theory for you. Maybe it's because he knew something we need to learn. And that is, not only is it important to have the right people in our life, it's also important to have the right people in the right place. That's right. Everyone in our life has a place. It's our job to put them there. And when something is this consequential, we can't afford to be casual in the way that we manage them. We've got to manage them intelligently. Because listen to me, your greatest joy and your greatest pain will come from the same place, relationships. Our Creator's given us a blueprint we put it in a book called Relational Intelligence, and I want to help you learn the Creator's way of defining, aligning, and assessing and activating your greatest relationships for your greatest potential. Relational Intelligence. And I want to jump right in. I want to jump right into the second installment of this series. And I want to read a couple of verses of scripture in an Old Testament book of the Bible called 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. I want to read beginning at verse number 18. 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're going to read beginning at verse number 18. It says this. It says, on the seventh day, the child died. David's attendants were afraid to tell him the child was dead for they thought while the child was still living, he wouldn't listen to us when we spoke to him. How can we now tell him that the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his attendants were whispering among themselves and he realized the child was dead. Is, is, is the child dead, he said? Yes, they replied, he is dead. Then David got up from the ground. After he washed, he put on lotions changed his clothes and went to the house of the Lord and worshiped then he went to his own house and at his request they served him food and he ate this is the reading of God's Word I want to talk from this subject today family I want to talk from this subject I want to talk about healing heartache healing heartache as I ease into this introduction today, I, I want to inform you that as long as you and I have residence in this world, we will all experience an array of aches. <laughs> yes, indeed, as Father Time begins to progress and get closer and closer to you and I, we will experience aches like tooth aches or for others headaches or for others it may be back aches and aches are not uncommon in the physical arena however when I deal with a physical ache very often there's a medical remedy I can take pain medication for certain aches, muscle relax, relaxers for certain aches, but there is an ache that goes beyond the realm of the physical. There is an ache that cannot be treated with natural physical remedy because I can take something when my tooth is hurting, take something when my head is hurting, take something when my back is hurting, but what can I take when my heart is hurting? What, 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 what do I take for a heartache? I, I need to address the ache. Here it is, because whenever you have an unaddressed ache in one area, it adversely impacts another area. I'm going to say that again. Whenever you have an unaddressed ache in one area, it can adversely impact another area. I used to have some back aches, but my back ache in one area was adversely impacting some other areas. It affected how I sat. It affected how I slept. It affected my mobility. And there are some times where we're dealing with issues in certain areas, but those issues are in certain areas are a result of aches in another area. 
What do I take <laughs> when my heart is hurting? Because when my heart is hurting, it'll show up in my relationships. Woo! When my <laughs> yeah, it'll show up in my choices. It'll when my heart is aching, aching it'll show up in my choices. Uh, people who make rebound relationship decisions are making rebound relationship decisions. They're choosing out of a heartache. The heart hadn't been healed from the ache and so the ache is impacting their choices. They are settling for less than God's best. Uh, heartaches will make you, here it is, heartaches will make you put a period where God wants to put a comma. Heartaches heartaches will impact adversely every area of our life. This is why the same named Solomon says in Proverbs chapter 4 verse number 23 guard your heart with all diligence because out of it flows the issues of life every area of my life is impacted by heartaches and, and what do you do when your heart is hurting well some people ignore it other people attempt to anesthetize it but what we should do is address it. But we can't address it without understanding it. And the word, look at me, for heartache is grief. Grief is deep sorrow that is felt in response to loss. It produces a myriad of emotions. C.S. Lewis said, no one ever told me grief felt so much like fear. Grief is not an evil emotion. It's not an emotion of inadequacy. It is a human emotion that is a natural and normal part of the healing process whenever you experience loss. Wherever there's loss, there's grief. And wherever there's grief, there's a heartache. And unfortunately, many people have limited the reality of grief to physical loss. When you lose a loved one and have to bury someone you never had to bury. And that is not incorrect, but it is incomplete. Because whenever you lose anything of value to you, your heart hurts. Uh, it doesn't hurt the same way for everything, but wherever there's loss, there's grief. So when you lose a job, there's grief. When you lose a relationship, there's grief. When you have a dream that never came to pass, but you realize it's not going to come to pass, so you lose something you never had but you feel so strongly about it you feel like you had it when you lose it it's all grief and there are many people who know when their back is hurting I feel this thing this morning they know when their back is hurting they know when their tooth is hurting but they don't know when their heart is hurting they don't know they're grieving <laughs> because the response to pain isn't always tears uh, somebody needs to talk back to me. I said the response to, to pain isn't always tears. Sometimes pain doesn't make you soft. Sometimes pain makes you hard. Sometimes pain makes you make vows and promises. Sometimes pain causes, you to, causes us to adopt lifelong philosophies based on temporary circumstances. Let somebody hurt you bad enough that one person will mess it up for everybody in the future because I made a permanent decision based on a temporary experience. Pain. And the response to pain isn't always tears. Grief. So, so, so here it is. I know, I know we're dealing, we're cooped up in the crib. And we're dealing with the ramifications of this pandemic and we're trying to conquer the reality of Corona. But, but here, here's my question. How your heart doing? I, I know you're tending to the kids and you should do that. They, they are your responsibility. They're my responsibility. They're the greatest assignment God's given us. He, he has tasked us with the responsibility of raising little ones. Not only they look like us, but raising little ones that look like him. He's given us the kingdom responsibility to do more than raise them, but to train them. He's called us to be proactive, not to be reactive. If we are to intercede for anybody, we should be interceding for them. We should right now, when they come out of the womb, you should be praying for her husband when he come out of the womb you should be praying for his wife you should be praying that God supernaturally suffocate and sabotage every satanic 
oh, every demonic, every diabolical relationship that has been sent to break their heart and to give them chronic and consistent heartache. Y'all aren't talking to me so that they live a life where grief is not just a path they walk, but it becomes a part of their personality because all they know is pain and loss. I know we're worried about children and we're worried about resources and we're worried about jobs, but here's my question. How is your heart? Because you can't tell me we've gone through all of this and your heart not hurting. Woo! You may not be crying, but it's hurting. You may not be taking medicine for it, but it's hurting. You may not know it's hurting, but it's hurting. There is no way you can experience this kind of loss and not have some kind of grief. Can't go outside. That's loss. Can't go connect with friends and family. That's loss. I'm not getting there able. I'm not able to have my graduation. You mean I got all these student loans and I can't even walk across the stage? That I can't even give my ha. Ah, that I'm the first one to go to school in my family, and my parents cannot even have the, the the privilege or the satisfaction of observing me receive a diploma that is evidence of my accomplishment. You mean that's not hurt me? You mean it's my senior year, and I'm not gonna be able to have my prom? You mean that I plan my wedding for this weekend? And I can't have my wedding. That's lost. Your heart is hurting. And the issue is, the, the issue is, here it is, here it is. The issue is things like grief go unaddressed because, because they're undetected. Because we expect it to show up looking a certain kind of way or feeling a certain kind of way it is what we feel whenever we experience loss and we need to we need to feel it we gotta we gotta detect it we gotta detect it we've gotta see it we've gotta address it the bible the bible's clear that everyone experiences this, even Jesus. One of the shortest scriptures in the Bible is in John 11, verse number 35. It says this, Jesus wept. <laughs> he wept. What was he weeping about? If you know the circumstances surrounding this story, someone that he loved very much passed away. His name was Lazarus. Jesus could have intervened in the situation and he did not intervene. And Lazarus passed away and Jesus wept. Jesus knew he was about to perform a medical anomaly and, and, and shift Lazarus from death to life. Jesus knew all of that. And even though he knew Lazarus was coming back to him, he still grieved because he lost him. The fact that he knew he would see him again didn't stop him from grieving the fact that he was gone. Why? Grief is the price you pay for caring. When you have stopped feeling, you stop caring. And for many people, this goes unaddressed. It goes undetected. They see this emotion as a sign of weakness and inadequacy, not realizing that God intends for this to be a part of our path. He just does not want it to become a part of our personality. In other words, we should experience grief, but grief does not have to eternally imprison us. The Bible puts it this way. We can go there, but we don't have to stay there. We can go there, but we don't have to stay there. The Bible puts it this way. Psalms 30 verse 5, it says, weeping may endure for a night <laughs> a, a, a night a, a time of darkness is a time for weeping when it's dark you're supposed to weep but that weeping should endure for a night darkness a season but then 
Joy is supposed to come in the morning. And I don't know who this is for. Maybe you've been going through a dark season. Maybe you feel like you're in a dark season now. But I can see the sun rising. I can see the sun cracking through the clouds. Good morning. It's morning time. And it's time to come out of weeping and time to come into joy. Yeah, this is this is a reality. I'm stuck in the house. I lost freedom. Some people lost resources. Some people lost clients. How's your heart doing? Are you ignoring what you should be addressing? Because the devil, our enemy, wants to use grief to give us a heart attack. Pastor, what, what, what do you mean? What do you mean? I thought you said grief is normal. It is normal. But when grief is unmanaged, it mutates into something called despair. Woo, I'm going to say that again. When grief is unmanaged, it mutates into something called despair. What's the difference? Grief is something you feel when you experience loss. Despair is a loss of hope. Ah, see, I don't know what you've lost, but I came to tell you whatever you lose, please don't lose hope. I'm going to say that one more time. I don't know what you've lost, but I came to tell you whatever you lost, please don't lose hope. And so, pastor, how do I stop grief from becoming despair? Grief, oh, I lost my job. Despair, I'm never getting another one. <sighs> Grief, oh, this relationship didn't work out. Despair, I'm never going to be happy. Grief, oh, this door closed in my face. Despair, I'm never going to get the right opportunity. When grief is unmanaged, it mutates into despair. Pastor, how do I stop grief from becoming despair? Oh, I feel you. It's heavy in your house right now. Hallelujah. I know you feel it. You sense it. But God, ref God refuses to allow you and me to settle for an emotional quality of life that is less than his best. And he gives us some insight on how to stop grief from becoming despair. He gives us some insight by allowing us to examine an individual in scripture named David because David had just in this text experienced a significant loss. What did he lose pastor? He lost a child. He lost a newborn baby. Can you imagine the pain he felt? Some of you, some of us can sympathize with David others can empathize with David because some have have literally sat where David sitting in this text you know the pain the grief that he's feeling you know what it means to be overwhelmed with emotion about something you can't alter some of, some of you can relate literally. Others of us can relate metaphorically. The, the baby he lost can represent losing something you gave birth to. <laughs> yeah, you gave birth to a business, gave birth to a ministry, gave birth to a project, gave birth to an album, gave birth to a fashion line, gave birth to a relationship. The, the baby can represent losing something you gave birth to. And maybe during this season, you feel like you're losing something you gave birth to and it's got your heart hurting. The baby can also represent something you have an emotional attachment to. Because during this pandemic, many people have lost some things that we are emotionally it attached to. And, and we're dealing with a degree and a dimension of pain that a painkiller will not help us fix. David lost a baby and he is in so much pain, he's on the floor and he can't get up. 
He's in so much pain that they were afraid to inform him of the child's transition, thinking he would do something desperate. But when they gave David the news, David did something that we can learn from. And it helps us make sure that our grief doesn't mutate in, in despair. He, I see three things that David did in the middle of his loss that we can do in the middle of our loss right now. I want to share them with you and then I'm going to get out of your way. Number one, the first thing that David did is he wept it's in the text the first thing he did is he wept and and weeping here means more than crying I'm not saying necessarily you have to cry but his weeping watch this was him honestly expressing his emotions did you hear what I just said yeah and your willingness to weep is a revelation of of your view of your God did you hear what I just said? Your willingness to weep is a revelation of your view of your God. If you see your God as a non-judgmental father, then you don't have to hide your emotions from him because you realize and recognize I can't hide from somebody omniscient. You, you already know everything. You know what I'm feeling. You know my thoughts from afar off. You know my thoughts because before they become thoughts. And so because you already know what I'm feeling, we might as well talk about what I'm feeling. I don't know if I should be feeling it, but I'm feeling it. I don't know if it's right, but I'm feeling it. I don't know if it makes me weak, but I'm feeling it. I don't know if it means I got little faith, but I'm feeling it because God, you can't help me when I'm hiding. Adam, Eve, where art thou? Come out of hiding. I can fix it if you'll come out. Somebody better come get me. He said, I can fix it if you'll come out. If you'll stop trying to sow those fig leaves for yourself and try to remedy the problem with your own human ingenuity, if you'll bring it to me, I'll fix it. Because before you created the problem I already had a solution there was a lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world he said I, I can't help you when you hiding Adam Eve where art thou I was I was naked and I was ashamed So your shame is an indication of how you see me. When shame before God is present, the right view of God is absent. <laughs> Psalms 103, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those that fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are but dust. Y'all better come get me. He said, he said, you didn't know that was in you, but I did. You didn't know you were capable of that, but I, 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 I knew it. <laughs> yeah. You didn't think you would ever be in a season in a space like this, but I did. And I made provision for it before the problem even existed. And I'll help you if you stop hiding. When are we going to talk about how you're feeling? Watch this. Because confession, homo lego, remember, we believe in affirmations and confession. But confession is when your heart and mouth agree. <laughs> Come on. Salvation doesn't even work if there's the confession out of the mouth without belief in your heart. Come on. That, that, is, that is a faith formula for sal salvation. is not formulaic, but there's a faith component that, that's incredibly important for salvation. And the Bible says, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So the confession is my heart and my mouth agree. So you say, I know what you're talking. Your heart not there yet, so let's talk about that. Because I can't get you there if you're going to keep acting like you already are. You already are. I'm going to say that one more time. Yeah, I can't get you where you need to be if you're acting like you're already there. You're not there. And I know you're not there. I'm omniscient. I, I see all things. You're not there. You talk in there and you're trying to talk yourself there. But you, you can't talk yourself there because there's some heart stuff we got to deal with. Your heart is hurting. And until I deal with your heartache, I can't help you. Come on. He wept. He got honest. 
He says, I can't deliver you if you're in denial. But if you'll feel for a minute, I'll heal. Woo! If you'll feel, I'll heal. If you'll feel, I'll heal. If you'll feel it, I'll heal it. If you'll feel it, I'll heal it. If you'll stop acting like the breakup didn't hurt you because your pride don't want, don't want to admit that you hurt and you just go on and acknowledge, I'm feeling it. God say, I'll heal it. <laughs> if you, if you, my God, if, if you, if you stop fronting like you're not discouraged, go ahead and admit you're dealing with some discouragement. I, I can turn your mourning into dancing. I can turn your beauty into ashes. I can cause you to reap in joy if you're so in tears. If you'll just feel it, I can heal it. David wept. Honest. Are you? Here it is. Here it is. Th there are times we say things like, honest to God. Here's my question. Are you honest with him? <laughs> ah. Yeah, if grief is not going to turn to despair, I got to weep. It means I've got to honestly Expose my emotions to a loving father who already knows what I feel. Uh, um, number two, number two, David not only wept, the Bible says he washed. <laughs> that, that's in the text. Uh, and, and here's the question. What does washing have to do with anything? What does washing have to do with anything? Well, washing was customary uh, for them during this time in history. Watch this prior <laughs> to a priest going into the tent of meeting to meet with God. <laughs> uh, did you hear what I just said? It, it, was, a meta <laughs> it was a metaphor. <laughs> In Exodus chapter 30, verse 20, it says, whenever they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so they will not die. Mm, they shall wash with water so they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting food, a food offering to the Lord. They, they, when they enter the tent of meeting or when they approach the altar to minister to the Lord by offering a food offering, they says they should wash. <laughs> oh, here it is. Here it is. Don't miss this. It, it was a symbol of purifying oneself. Before they went into the presence of God, it was symbolic. It was a metaphor for cleansing myself before I went into the presence of God. Here it is. Because when I'm grieving, dirt get on me. I'm trying to find the honest people in here. Today. I said, when you're grieving, some things will get on you. You don't know are on you. When, when you're grieving, you'll think things you don't think when you're not grieving. You, <laughs> you'll consider things <laughs> that you wouldn't normally consider when you're grieving. You'll say things. Where's my church? You will say things you wouldn't normally say when you're grieving. Anybody honest enough to say, man, when I'm in pain, I, I think some things I wouldn't normally think and say some things I wouldn't normally say. Things get on us. Anger gets on us. Rage gets on us. All sorts of emotions get on us. And David says, after I get done weeping, I need to do some washing. Because, hallelujah, I wasn't called and created to wear this. Did you hear what I just said? I wasn't created to wear this. You may have gotten on me, but you can't stay on me. I want somebody to put in the comments, get off me. Get off me. Get off me. I don't know what's on you, but this is your day for it to get off you. Fear, get off me. Anger, get off me. The desire for revenge. I'm preaching right there. I said the desire for revenge get off me. I got to wash. <laughs> I got to wash. I got to wash. My heart's become hard. I got to wash. My, my attitude becomes cold. I, I've got to wash. I've been burned so much. I'm cynical. I don't trust people the way I used to. I got to wash. I don't want to be generous anymore because people exploit my generosity. I got to wash. The devil wants it to stay on you, but you got to get it off you. He wants to attack your heart. Did you know what Jesus did? Do you know what Jesus did? Do you know what, Je Do you know what Jesus did when he was hanging on that cross? The Bible says they put a spear in his side, blood and water. 
came streaming down. That water is a metaphor for the cleansing work of Jesus. Watch this. But there was a, his water is a metaphor for the cleansing work he does for us. Don't miss this. But he was already clean. Pastor, so, so because he was washed, he didn't let some things hinder him on the cross from inviting a thief to be with him this day in paradise. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. See, when Judas betrayed him, something could have got on Jesus that would have made him so hard-hearted he would not have been open-minded enough to minister to a thief. Did you hear what I just said? See, God wants to use, uh, the devil wants to use Judas to burn you so bad on Thursday that you won't save the thief on Friday. Somebody help me preach this. I said the devil wants to use Judas to burn you, to hurt you so bad on Friday that your heart is not open enough to help the thief. Y'all follow me here? Got to wash. What got on you when you were grieving? Right now, is something on you? Are you a little more irritable than you normally are? Are you a little more frustrated than you normally are? What, what got on you that needs to get off? David wept. David washed. And number three, y'all better come get me now. I'm telling you, this is my point right here. Yes, indeed. If you, if you can't preach yourself happy, you should not be preaching. Yeah, if you don't get excited about your own preaching, you should not be preaching to anybody else. I'm telling you that right now. If it does not work for you, it's, it's not going to work for anybody else. I'm telling you, I love number three. Number three says he worshiped. After he washed, he worshiped. He worshiped. He went to the house of God and he worshiped. Y'all, please don't miss this. Why is this important? He says, in other words, this is his way of saying, I can't be mad at the only one that can fix what's broke. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. He says, I got to worship because remember, he was praying and fasting for the child to live. And the text says, read it, on the seventh day, the child died. Why would the text tell us he died on the seventh day? Well, here's why the text would tell us he died on the seventh day. Because on the eighth day, males that were a part of Israel were circumcised. And circumcision, Paul says, I was circumcised the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin. Here it is. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant. <laughs> it's, it's, it's God's way of saying, I got an agreement with you. That, that, that you and me are in a will, in a testament together. He died on the eighth, the seventh day, which is before he became a part of God's covenant community, saying, this wasn't my will for this to live as long as you wanted it to live. So even though it didn't live as long as you wanted it to live, you can blame me or you can worship me for letting you have it for seven days when you didn't deserve it for any. Y'all miss what I just said because this child was a result of David's union prematurely with Bathsheba when he had Bathsheba's cousin killed. Don't miss this now. God didn't kill the baby. Life happened. Don't miss this. But I want you to see the revelation here. David says, I can't get mad if you didn't spare something that I never deserved to have in the first place. So I can be mad because it's gone or I can be glad that you let me have it as long as you let me have it. I want to know is there a worshiper here that's honest enough to say I just got to pause and I just got to praise God because I'm in a house and I'm believing God that I'm going to keep it. But if I lose it, I ain't deserve it anyway. You've been better to me than I've been to myself. And the same God that gave me that one 
is the same God that'll give me another one. Watch me worship my way out of this. Watch me worship until my tears of sadness become tears of joy. Watch me worship until my weakness turn into strength. Watch me worship until I get my spiritual swag back. He worshiped. I'm done. And the text says, he then went to the temple and comforted Bathsheba because she had to be hurting worse. I lost my husband and my child in less than a year. Oh, that, that's Bathsheba. During these days, God never commanded it, but it was a cultural practice and God remedied it and rectified it in the New Testament. Uh, 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 but it was a cultural practice. Men would take multiple wives. It wasn't Christian. It was cultural, right, during these days. And so David had other options. Bathsheba didn't. I lost my husband and my child in less than a year. And the Bible says David went and comforted Bathsheba. See, this is why the enemy wants us to have heart attacks. Because he knows when you recover from the heart attack like David did, your recovery positions you for ministry. He said, Bathsheba, I know how to help you now. Because I've been helping myself. I know more than concepts. I know more than platitudes. My heart was broken. And Jesus healed it. Now I'm getting ready to say something. I'm way over my time. I shouldn't be preaching this long. But I, I, I got to say this to you. This heart healing, heart healers right now, is the greatest need in the body of Christ. This is the greatest need right now in the body of Christ. No more concepts and theories. No more. We, we need more than people who are comforting with concepts that have not worked in their own soul. Are you healed? Because you can give me concept and theory, but when I try to put it into practice, if you have not practiced it yourself, when I run into roadblocks, you won't be able to help me. You can give me the Greek and the Hebrew for forgiveness, but if you have not walked through unforgiveness in your own life and overcame it and conquered it, you're going to be limited in your ability to walk me through it. And I am telling you right now, some of you have gone through too much heartbreak to waste it. The area where the devil attacks you the worst is the area where God wants to use you the most. Did you hear me? The area where the devil attacks you the most is the area, the worst is the area God wants to use you the most. Hallelujah. And so some of you today, you're dealing with grief, you're dealing with loss. God in heaven is going to help you. I want to pray for you. Because that grief cannot turn to despair. All is not lost. God wants to heal you because there's a Bathsheba you're supposed to help. Father, I thank you right now for the healing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Woof. I pray right now that you give us grace to weep, to wash, and to worship. You heal the brokenhearted, and you bind up our wounds. Do it, Lord Jesus, for your people. It's in your name I pray. Amen.